Hello and welcome. I'm David Petreko from the Nautical Institute's headquarters staff here in London. And we're joined today uh, by a, a fantastic uh, panel of uh, experts in the field of cybersecurity. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. 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 morning David. Okay, I hope everybody is familiar with the Nautical Institute, but if not, we are the international professional body uh, for uh, mariners, and our main role is to help our members with their professional development. Uh, in addition to that, we also represent our members' views at various uh, national and international forum. We have a seat at the IMO, we work with IALA, et cetera, et cetera. And we do this to share information. We share information by listening to our members and we share information by sh giving that information to members. And we do that because with professional sharing information, we all make better decisions. And that, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Now that may be better decisions for the purpose of safety, it may be commercial, it may be personal, but it is about making better decisions. Now, of course, today's subject is cybersecurity. And this is an area where better decisions um, are absolutely cr critical. So this, this is why the Nautical Institute is holding this event. This is an interactive event. Um, although your microphones and cameras will not work, uh, you can write in. There's a little area in your control panel where you can type a question. Uh, just remember to hit the little send button. Uh, there are some handouts uh, that you can download and there will be a couple polls, so uh, you can be ready for those. After the webinar, uh, there will be a pop-up survey. It only takes about two minutes, but it helps us improve our offering. So if you can spare a couple minutes, uh, please do. About a couple hours after the webinar finishes, you will get an email saying, thank you very much for attending. And there will be a personalized CPD certificate there uh, for you. So uh, feel free to download that. This event is being recorded. Um, probably by the end of tomorrow, that recording will be available freely on our YouTube channel. So feel free to share that with your friends and colleagues. Now, you are not alone. There are nearly 900 of you out there. Um, so when you do write in with your questions, if you can be as succinct as possible, we would welcome that. So off we go. Um, gentlemen, you can uh, remove your cameras except for John and Chris uh, Cronus. Um, John Lloyd, Captain John Lloyd is our CEO and I will hand over to you, John, to proceed with the event. Uh, David, thank you very much for the introduction and, and thanks to the uh, panelists for making the uh, time available today. But most importantly, thank you to all of you for calling in from uh, around the globe. Uh, as David says, I'm, I'm John Lloyd, Chief Executive of the Nautical Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first webinar hosted by the Nautical Institute Foundation, addressing a fundamental safety issue for mariners, one that's often talked about and yet operationally overlooked. And I believe it presents the gravest economical and operational threat encountered every day uh, by ships in, in working at sea. Um, we have some expert speakers, as you've seen, and it's a great pleasure for me to, first of all, welcome uh, Cronus Kapolidis, who is General Senior Manager, Training and Advisory Services for Hudson Analytics, promoting the company's synergies on issues related to security, both physical and cyber. Cronus, over to you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, John, and welcome, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Uh, but before I start talking about the topic that I would like to cover, I think it is important for all of us uh, to watch a short video that will set uh, the ground for the discussion that will follow in this webinar. So, uh, David, if we can have the video, please. Okay. Fierce storms and rough waters are no longer the biggest threats to the maritime industry. Modern vessels depend on computer systems and satellite communications that make them vulnerable to cyber attacks on their navigational systems, critical software, and operational systems. Pirates of the modern world have the ability to conduct cyber attacks that can cripple a shipping business, compromising the safety and security of crews and passengers, the integrity of our coastlines and waterways, the viability of the vessels, and the reputation of the business. 
It's estimated, for example, that by 2018, cyber attacks against oil and gas infrastructure will cost energy companies close to $1.9 billion. Consider the following scenario. A sophisticated team of hackers targets a company that manages a large international tanker fleet that includes VLCCs. The hackers implant malware on several USB drives, strategically dropping them in high traffic areas near where the crews join their vessel. On their way to the vessels, several crew members find the drives. Once on board, they grab some coffee during a break and plug them into their shipboard computers, hoping to find something interesting. As they sip their coffee, malware silently infects the vessel's onboard systems and provides a gateway into the network. Not having the latest patches, the critical workstations and servers on the vessels are immediately compromised. When the vessel sends the next update to the office, the malware proceeds to infiltrate the ship management company's corporate computers, using them as a springboard into infecting the entire fleet over several weeks. Think this sounds far-fetched? Think again. This technique is a simple form of social engineering that hackers use time and time again to compromise data. And it works. Meanwhile, the crew remains unaware that hackers have silently launched a cyber attack to begin taking control of several key systems. These modern-day pirates now control one of the ships without ever stepping foot on the vessel, and the downward spiral begins. After several systems on the ship begin to fail, the vessel owner receives an anonymous phone call informing him that he is no longer in control of the ship. The caller explains that if his demands are not met, the entire fleet will suffer the same fate. The captain and crew are not trained to handle a situation like this and haven't developed contingency plans in the event of a takeover. They also don't know whether the hacks may be triggered by GPS position or a time and date event. Shutting down satellite communications or GPS will leave the ship without navigation and communications, making the situation even graver. He alerts his crew to begin the override procedures, but many of them are untrained and struggle to regain control. Having no other option and risking an expensive business interruption event, an environmental disaster, and a destroyed company reputation, the ship management company is forced to meet the demands of the cyber pirates. Could this attack have been prevented? The answer is yes. With better security oversight and a comprehensive employee training program, this attack could have been mitigated. Trained employees who understand social engineering techniques and using properly patched systems would have saved this fleet. The bottom line is that cyber threats to the maritime industry are real, and the consequences are severe. Cyber criminals are using our ever-increasing dependence on computers to conduct corporate espionage, cause environmental damage, destroy customer confidence, and put employee and customer safety at risk. As the maritime industry's reliance on complex computer systems and the adoption of always-on internet communications grows, so will the threat of potentially catastrophic cyber attacks. Thank you, David. Uh, so we did see the video. Obviously, this is a video we created at Hudson a few years ago. But uh, I think one of the key elements, one of the key lessons learned from this specific video is the value of employee training, as it is called. So uh, we, this is uh, the focus of this webinar. But before we move forward and discuss that, I would like to share a few uh, information regarding cybersecurity in the shipping industry per se. So, uh, this, these are the topics that I'm going to uh, touch upon today in my presentation. Very briefly, for those of you who don't know us, Hudson Analytics is a global maritime risk management company uh, with uh, our headquarters in Philadelphia and offices around 13 cities uh, all around the world. And security, including physical and cyber, is one of the five divisions uh, within Hudson Analytics. Our cyber division, Hudson Cyber, does three things. Uh, we do uh, risk assessments and risk evaluations, cyber threat intelligence, and training, which is one of the things that uh, we are focusing on here today. These are some of our global partners. As you can see, the Nautical Institute is in there, but we work with different organizations around the globe because cybersecurity is such a broad topic that it is impossible for any company to deal with cybersecurity on its own. 
So let's provide a bit of context regarding cybersecurity. These are the, uh, this, the global risk landscape table from the World Economic Forum. And uh, even though it is difficult to read, I have highlighted for you the five different risks that relate to cybersecurity and information technology. And this ranking is based on impact and likelihood, as you see on the table. And you can see how cybersecurity is becoming a, a considerable risk, not only for shipping, this is for the global industry. And on the right side uh, on the screen, you can see how these trends are expected to grow over time in the next few years. So our cyber dependency, as we call it, is only going to grow, causing a lot of issues that we will touch upon in a bit. But let's do some uh, ground leveling initially. It is important to understand that cybersecurity is not only an IT issue. It's not only the IT department that has to deal with cybersecurity in an organization. Also, cybersecurity is not just a checklist. Obviously, the IMO's resolution about cybersecurity that was introduced as of this year, January 2021, is very important, but we need to deal with cybersecurity beyond the checklist approach. And of course, for all of us, for the seafarers uh, that you're all out there on board the ships for a prolonged period of time because of the pandemic, we all have to do something about cybersecurity. We all have a role to play in this cybersecurity journey of any organization. But it is also important to understand what is at risk in our organizations. So it is important initially to answer a fundamental question. And that question relates to, uh, tries to answer whether our industry, the maritime industry, the maritime supply chain is a target. Well, if we see at this table, uh, I would say that it definitely has been, is and will continue to be. You can see on the red highlighted circle there that over the last few years, mainly because of the pandemic, we are seeing a rapid increase in the numbers of cyber attacks and we will see some stats in a bit. But uh, we have offered uh, a handout which is available in the handout section uh, of this webinar where you can download the document with more details on all the attacks that you see here. So I would urge you uh, to download it and have a look to learn a bit more about how our industry is actually a target when it comes to cyber attacks. But like I said previously, the pandemic has played a key role um, in this cyber journey within the maritime industry. This is um, a graph that was released by the Nautical Institute uh, a few weeks ago, and it shows how the attacks have increased over the last three years from 50 attacks, um, for, from 50 cyber breaches, uh, to be precise, on the maritime industry in uh, 2017, now we're more than 500 over uh, 2020, and that is mainly because of the pandemic. So what should we do? What is the problem here? Well, these are some of the technology solutions that a lot of organizations and a lot of companies like Hudson are providing to the industry, but this is not enough. And this is not enough because all of us, most of us have to work from home. And as you can see, the home working environment is more or less like you see, on the uh, cartoon here. And of course, if you look at the stats, we were not well trained and we were not well prepared to start working from home. So that creates an issue that has to be addressed along with the technology issue and the technology solution that we see in the middle. But at the same time, we have all of you, we have our seafarers, we have our field workers on ports that continue to be in the field, continue to operate remotely, and you all require more internet connectivity, there is a gap of understanding regarding cybersecurity as we discuss. So if we put all this together, we have a very explosive mixture, if I can call it that. And the solution is not just a technology one, but it's also raising awareness and help, helping people understand what the actual problem is. So to look at all of us, and this is uh, also another document that's available in the handouts, uh, that specific magazine, The Navigator, it is important to understand how we can be a threat to our ship. This is a graph which shows all the different things that our devices, our phones know about us. And based on the findings that are presented on the specific magazine, The Navigator one, this, uh, this data is of, of 14,000 uh, US dollars of value to a cyber criminal. So even if we believe that we are not important, we are actually very important and very valuable. 
At the same time, the phones that we use are carriers of malware. You can see again some percentages that are presented in the paper. These are the likelihood of our phones carrying malicious um, code and malicious software in them. Again, the same research identified that 40, 30, uh, 43% of you said that you were on board ships and you had issues regarding cybersecurity. And our role also is about passwords. And lately, we've seen a lot of discussions about passwords. We, the majority of us, use the same password for our personal and corporate devices. And in most cases, these are pretty weak passwords. So we need to be cautious because we are playing a key role in this equation. So what you do? Well, very briefly, we should evaluate what the risk is. We should understand what the risk is. And, on, and when it comes to us, we should train. And that is why the Nautical Institute has partnered with Hudson and we created the Maritime Cybersecurity Awareness for Seafarers course. But uh, the other speakers will talk more about it. So I would like to thank you for your attention and now come back to you uh, to ask you one question, which I think is very important. David? Okay, so thanks, Kronos. Uh, the question is, how important is cybersecurity to your daily job and activities? So if you can choose one of those five and press submit. Uh, I'll just get, give it a minute, uh, Kronos, if you want to talk about something. Yeah, so it is important to make sure that everyone understands that cybersecurity has or doesn't have a role to play in our daily activities. We have seen over the years that a lot of things that we were doing manually or in person, now we do it digitally. So maybe that uh, will help you understand and think about the role of cybersecurity in your daily activity. So take the next few um, seconds to answer that because it is uh, important also for us to be able to understand how all of you look at cybersecurity. And I think I am, as I am looking at uh, the stats, uh, people do understand that cybersecurity is very important and that is uh, very good and it will help us navigate the discussions that we'll be having forward. So let's keep these stats in mind. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and pass the floor back to you, John. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Cronus, and, and thank you for setting the scene. Uh, fantastically. Of course, when it all goes wrong, we we, we turn to our, our insurers and our P and I um, organisations to to address the issues. And so, it's a great pleasure to introduce Chris Adams, who served at sea as a navigating officer with with Element City Liners of London. He holds a BSc honours degree in nautical studies, studied at the University of Southampton. He joined Steamship Mutual as an Admiralty claims handler in 1979. Um, and is currently Managing Director of Steamship Insurance Management Services Limited and Head of Loss Prevention and the European Syndicate. Chris, welcome. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed for that intro, uh, John, and uh, welcome everybody and good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you happen to be in the globe. Now, the, the medium through which we're all attending today's event is one that we've become only too familiar with over the last 16 months or so and it serves very much to emphasize the importance of the internet and our IT systems in maintaining business contacts, sustaining our business relationships and sharing knowledge and experience as we're doing today. When the COVID pandemic arrived and there was a prolonged requirement for those of us with office-based operations to work remotely, it's highlighted how critical our IT systems are to business continuity. We're relying upon IT very heavily. Um, however, uh, sitting alongside that reliance is the potential for vulnerability, and there's ample evidence uh, that since remote working um, arrangements have been in place, that cyber attacks of one form or another have been increasing exponentially. If any reminder was needed of the risk, it was only last Friday that a US-based software management supplier was hit by a ransomware attack which has affected thousands of computer systems in many countries. The perpetrators have demanded an overall ransom of $70 million for the encryption key, and that highlights the costliness of cyber weakness. These risks, though, aren't restricted to land-based operations. Ships uh, are similarly and increasingly exposed to cyber vulnerabilities, and they arise from the combination of increased connectivity and increased levels of autonomous control, uh, globally accessible navigation systems, data and connectivity 
have become ever more important to um, the operational efficiency of shipping companies. And with the collection and exchange of that data, cybersecurity management becomes critically important, hence the drive to encompass cybersecurity uh, in vessel safety management systems. Now, there's an understandable sensitivity about publicizing cybersecurity events, and it's likely that the true extent of successful cyber attacks is underreported. But to give this some perspective, the cybersecurity specialists, uh, Naval Day, were on record as saying there's been a 900% increase in attacks on maritime stakeholders over the last three years. Um, there have, though, been some prominent incidents in the shipping sector that have made the headlines. Uh, the disruption suffered by MESC in 2017 was well publicised, and last year MSC, Anglo Eastern, CMA, CGM were all victims of cyber attacks which disrupted their systems. Um, more recently, South Korea's HMM was a victim of a cyber attack on its email system last month. Now, all, all of those attacks were hugely disruptive for the company, but their impact was felt primarily in short based operations. Um, as such, they are not likely to have had any impact on P&I insurance where we're concerned with liabilities that arise from the operation of ships. The sort of insurance protection that's required to respond to the consequences of attacks such as those that hit the companies I've just mentioned is cyber risk insurance and that provides the financial resources and the expert advice needed to address things such as the restoration of systems and data, financial losses, PR management and legal costs and that sort of thing. What's of more relevance to P&I, however, are attacks that have an impact on ships themselves. Uh, and as we've seen from the video, those attacks could in, uh, involve navigation systems and critical control systems. There have been experiments and tests conducted by ethical hackers uh, which demonstrated that such attacks are both possible and can result in those systems being compromised. There are regular reports of GPS interference and disruption in various areas of the world, and those are usually associated with things such as military exercises, armed conflict, disputes over subsea resources, and illegal fishing, and that sort of thing. Attacks which target ship control systems are more serious. There was a worrying incident off South Africa last year in which five ships found themselves with a loss of control that resulted in them proceeding in circles. So I'm, I'm not aware that the cause of that was ever explained. A couple of years ago, the US Coast Guard issued a marine safety alert about an incident on a deep draft vessel on an international voyage that was bound for New York. Uh, the ship reported that it was experiencing a significant cyber incident which affected its shipboard uh, network. It turned out that malware had significantly degraded the ship's uh, computer systems, but unfortunately, critical uh, control systems had not been compromised. That investigation went on to find that the vessel was operating without effective cybersecurity measures, which then exposed the vulnerabilities of the control systems. Prior to the incident, the security risk presented by the shipboard network was apparently well known to the crew, but had not been addressed. After that incident, the US Coast Guard said it was imperative for the maritime community to adapt to changing technologies and the changing threat landscape by recognising the need for and implementing basic cyber hygiene measures. All vessel operators were encouraged to conduct cyber security assessments to better understand the extent of those vulnerabilities. And this is a timely reminder of the purpose of the 2021 uh, ISM requirements. Now, when it comes to um, ship systems, as with uh, and as the video highlights, as with the cybersecurity threats that we face in our own daily lives, it's reasonable to assume that the cybersecurity threat to the shipping industry is likely to grow rather than diminish. Therefore, preparedness and training are imperative to defend against that threat. The principal cyber threat to ship systems is very similar uh, to that facing shore-based operations and that threat comes from familiar issues, things like failing to promptly implement security software, software security patches, a lack of uh, cyber security awareness and weak procedures, weak access controls, the absence of any password policy and requirements for those to be regularly changed, the extent of the internet access that's allowed on board and the extent of restrictions on, on downloads and the use and control of portable media such as USB drives as highlighted in the video. And 
the issue of device connectivity with ship systems is is important things like smartphones uh, and of course the ever-present dangers posed by social engineering and uh, the use of social media and as from January this year, issues such as these should be addressed by the ship's safety management system if it didn't do so already. Now, it's important here to emphasise that the, the significant line of defence that every ship has uh, against becoming a casualty of a cyber attack. Uh, happily, for those of you who are still at sea, we're not yet in the world of autonomous ships and humans still act as watchkeeping officers. They're trained, you're trained, not to rely upon a single source of data. You should use your intuition and sense check information that's derived from electronic sources against that which is apparent from the physical environment in which the ship's operating. It's actually very reassuring to note that from those incidents of GPS interference, the number of times those irregularities were first noticed, reported and acted upon by officers on board the ships that experienced them. There will no doubt be future incidents in which ships' computer systems are compromised by, cyber, by a cyber event, but it doesn't automatically follow that PNI liabilities will inevitably arise because of that. There's a safety buffer of human intervention that exists to counter the disruption of a cyber incident that will remain in place for a considerable time to come. And of course, seafarer training to raise awareness of cyber security serves to reduce the risk of a ship becoming a victim of a cyber attack in the first place. To touch briefly on PI insurance and cyber risk, our cover doesn't exclude cyber risk uh, under our own mutual and non war charter uh, rules. Uh, that means that PI liabilities that are within the scope of club cover under members' terms of entry that arise from an event that has a cyber incident, either as its cause or a contributing cause, are capable of mutual cover. There would be an exclusion, though, if the nature of the cyber institute constituted a, either terrorism or war risk. But like an attack on a shore-based operation, a successful cyber attack on a vessel could leave owners exposed to financial consequences that are outside the scope of PI cover. For example, the cost of restoration of the vessel systems, data recovery, loss of use of the ship whilst uh, uh, systems are restored. And, and we can provide a separate cover for that if it's required. The PI clubs are not involved in setting operational standards for members in relation to cybersecurity. That's an operational uh, issue for owners uh, because it involves compliance with flag state requirements. But all PNI clubs' rules require their members to ensure that from the time a ship is entered and throughout the period of entry, they comply with all statutory requirements of the flag state relating to, from, um, amongst other things, security and safety management of the entered ship, uh, and that they maintain at all times the validity of statutory certificates. Um, as I'm sure you know, uh, since January of this year, it's become mandatory for cybersecurity management to be addressed within a vessel safety management system by the time of the first annual verification of the company's DOC after that date. Um, but the incorporation of cybersecurity requirements in the vessel's SMS is only part of the picture. The effectiveness of the SMS is improved by appropriate training. As a PNI club, we clearly see the benefit of providing crew with training in many aspects of vessel operations. That training serves to improve safety of life at sea and avoid incidents that can generate PI liabilities. The same considerations apply to cybersecurity. And we firmly believe that the Nautical Institute Foundation Cybersecurity Awareness course and the Nautical Institute certification that follows successful completion of the course will greatly assist uh, both owners and seafarers in demonstrating that an appropriate level of training has been achieved in cybersecurity awareness and um, help to protect vessels from the risk of cyber attack in the future. Um, that brings me to the end of what I was going to say this morning, so I'll um, we'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions if there are later on. Um, back to you, John. Chris, thank you very much indeed, and, and some really useful insights about the, the, the impact and, and, and how um, owners and operators can um, protect their interests and, and, and certainly how, how that's administered. So thank you very much for those insights. Uh, our final speaker this morning is, is Colin Payne. Um, 
Collins had an outstanding career in the, in the maritime sector, including many years with the Swire Marine Group, working in P&G, Australia, and other appointments around the globe. Specialising in a range of issues surrounding human behaviour, Colin now brings these skills to the role of Chief Executive of the Nautical Institute Foundation. Uh, Colin, thank you, and uh, over to you. Right. <clears throat> thank you, John. Yes, this morning um, I'm going to be talking about uh, our cyber training course, and, uh, and I'll depart slightly from that later and just talk about the NIF itself and its vision and mission, and obviously we'll have time for questions uh, a bit later. Next slide, David. Yeah, just a quick one. So I'm I'm a, a master mariner who worked a, who has been working ashore in very uh, many many management roles since 1990, primarily in Papua New Guinea and uh, Singapore. Whilst in Singapore, I returned to university and, and studied for a master's uh, degree in guidance and counselling, primarily because I wanted to change career. Uh, when I left Swire. Um, that hasn't quite worked in that way. Um, my part-time counselling roles uh, led me to see huge potential in everybody despite their life uh, journey. So on retirement, I continued to engage with private clients and actually work with an aviation company in Australia and Asia as their EAP vendor. Late in 2020, um, I was able to assist the NIF um, uh, in a temporary CEO role after the previous CEO, Jonathan Stoneley, passed away. Uh, and then recently I went through a, a recruitment process with them and managed to hold on to the job. Um, so I'm primarily concerned with people and their ability to grow. And I find this role with the NIF very exciting and the chance to build transformative courses to help people be the best they can. So I'm a member of the North Institute and the American uh, Counseling Association. Next one, David. So uh, just before I joined, actually, the NIF um, needed to start off with a course, and they developed their first flagship course, which is this one on cybersecurity. Um, it's been developed uh, with industry leaders on this topic, namely Hudson Cyber. And uh, and um, it's been designed to meet the requirements of the IMO legislation and hopefully very competitively priced to recover development costs. Um, so we hope you will find this course very useful. Um, it's certainly been uh, an interesting journey for the um, NIF trustees who've taken quite a lot of time and care to produce the best course we can. Okay, David. So what's in the course? Um, well, primarily it's designed to meet all the needs of the IMO um, and maritime cyber risks refer to a myriad of events and circumstances which could result in operational safety or security failures. And cyber risk management is the process of de-escalating the risk to an acceptable level, considering the costs and benefits of actions taken to stakeholders. The overall goal, I think, here is to support safe and secure shipping, uh, which is primarily or fundamentally operationally resistant or re uh, resilient to uh, cyber risks. You, If you're not already aware, you can find uh, guidance from the IMO, they've issued a couple of um, documents. The first one here is Guidelines on Maritime Cyber Security uh, Risk Management. Um, they set out very high level recommendations for maritime risk management, um, primarily to safeguard shipping from current and emerging cyber threats. But as we know, with cyber security, it's, it's changing all the time. The Recommendations can be incorporated into existing uh, risk management processes and are complementary to the risk and security management practices already established by the IMO. The uh, resolution uh, encourages administrations to ensure that cyber risks are appropriately addressed in existing safety management systems as defined in the ISM code. 
as um, Chris mentioned, no later than the first annual verification of the company's document of compliance after the 1st of January this year. Okay, David. So how do we present this? Well, basically we've set the course up so it's an interactive journey through the life of a new seafarer joining a company for the first time. And uh, it's, its aim is to create an awareness of why cybersecurity is a challenge in the industry today. And as we've seen, um, it certainly is a challenge and it's, it costs companies quite a lot of money. It should provide insults, insights into some real problems associated with this and discuss what are the risks. And as you'll see in the course, it's a, it's a way to empower individuals to share in the ownership of the problem because it's not just a company problem, it's not just an individual problem, it's a shared problem. And uh, it demonstrates the reach of the problems and solutions as we see them at the moment. We also discuss mitigations that individuals can take to downgrade the risk. And I think this is where a lot of people will find this course useful. And it provides some insight into what can be done in the event of a successful cyber attack, which as again, Chris has said, there have been a number of successful cyber attacks. Okay, David, next slide. So as John mentioned, we are, the Nautical Institute Foundation is a new, new body. It was formed in the, in the middle of last year. It's a wholly owned subsidiary, not-for-profit, focused on improving safety and awareness in the wider maritime community, particularly where topics receive less attention from commercial training companies or where we see there are gaps in essential learning, which may still exist. We hold uh, conversations with governments, p &I clubs, corporates, other professional bodies to address stubborn and ongoing safety issues to the maritime industry. Uh, which have not yet been fully resolved. And we will work together with any organization to fund and develop cost-effective training solutions. We're, we're lean, uh, we operate a lean and cost-conscious organization and we try, strive to deliver the highest possible value to our customers. Thank you, David. Uh, this vision and mission uh, hasn't been finalized yet, but this is where we are at the moment. And we aim to be a respected producer of training and risk management uh, materials for the maritime industry and to facilitate the distribution of these at the least cost so that no person may be denied access to knowledge that prevents maritime casualties, environmental damage or personal industry, uh, injury. And our mission uh, is by listening to the maritime community, we'll develop courses that are where there are perceived gaps in existing available quality training material that will support excellence and professional development of all seafarers and associated industry. Uh, we have initial target of 20 courses by the end of 25, end of 2025. Again, these are works in process. We haven't signed off fully on this vision and mission, but I thought I'd share with you uh, the sort of direction we're heading with this. Thank you, David. Oh, you've gone too far, one too far. So the Nautical Institute, uh, uh, sorry, the Nautical Institute Foundation is based and headquartered within the NI offices in London. We have a governance board of six very active individual trustees from across the industry. And we have room to grow this in the future as we gain momentum. Uh, as I say, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the NI, and, but we have the scope to extend beyond NI membership, ensuring the work is available to all in the shipping industry. So the courses that the NIF will uh, produce will not be restricted to NI members. We intend to try and offer them to a much wider community. And that's about the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Back to you, John.
Right, John, as, as you're coming online, I'm just going to launch one more poll question here. Thank so, you, David. Have you ever received maritime specific cyber awareness training? Uh, John, do you want to say a word or two about this? Well, it's interesting that this is a point that uh, has come up um, from a number of the um, the audience, uh, in, including um, a question from Japan, uh, Naoki, um, and, 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 and another um, delegate, uh, Hani, um, who, who has asked similar questions. And, and, and it relates to really that whether we, um, we think cybersecurity should be included in the uh, competency or familiarization of the SDCW um, regime. Um, and we know we have resolutions, but it's about whether it should be mandatory or not. So I'll just um, I'll just comment a little bit about that um, after we see the results of the poll um, and then see. Um, there we go, you. John. Uh, yeah, no, so uh, there we see. Um, so we've, we have uh, a mixed picture of the, more or less half of the, um, the participants not having had uh, maritime specific training and the other half, yes, um, either, either online or through their, um, their own organization. So it's, it's a picture there that um, r relates to possibly an indication uh, that, that there is more, more to be done. So uh, David, thank you. Thank you for hosting those polls and, and, and sharing the results. I think okay. we'll, we'll move to the, um, the questions and answers now I invite the other panelists to, um, to come back to the desk as it were um, I, I, I guess one of the, um, the the tensions we have is um, around this compulsory element of, of you know we, we need to make it compulsory or no one's going to do it and I think that that's um, it's a bit of a pity really uh, within the maritime community that that is so often the case that we, we we wait for the IMO to tell us what to do you know this is a real risk um, and, and whether it's cyber or whether it's other safety management things I think the uh, the, the responsible ship owners the responsible operators are the people showing leadership in this sort of direction um, so um, maybe it will become mandatory um, in, in due course, um, but I think that the, the risks are clearly identified, um, and, and certainly under the resolutions and so on, it's a very important part that we should be addressing um, every every day of the, the week anyway. Um, but we have um, enough, so thank you for those questions, um, and, and I think certainly part of the familiarisation. Um, Cronus, would you agree with that part of the familiarisation um, within shipboard joining routines and so on? <laughs> Absolutely, because uh, like uh, it was illustrated, I think, through all the different uh, presenters, it is very important to understand that cyber is another risk to the risk registry, if we can call it that, of uh, the maritime sector. And it is important to address that. And uh, we have indications, obviously, uh, it's still in a, a preparatory stage, but we have indications that the IMO is looking at uh, making a cyber uh, element, cyber awareness, uh, as a mandatory part of test STCW still remains to be seen when that will happen. But I would urge the seafarers and shipping companies to be proactive and offer that training, offer that capability uh, to their crew and officers to become trained and understand what are the risks so they can better prepare both themselves but also their companies. Yes, and, 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 a, and a similar point made by uh, Shashidharan um, that with the increasing um, cyber threat and increasing vessel automation, that this uh, you know would benefit from being. Yeah. Um, uh, just uh, John, just to add, add to Cronus's comments, that the uh, I think it's also important that cyber security training is not just done once a box is ticked and you move on. It's something that needs to be repeated on a very, very regular, a regular basis because people become com complacent and the sophistication of those who want to attack our cyber systems is growing growing all the time so i you need to uh, you need to repeat this training needs to be repeated on a regular regular basis and for example within our own org organization we test the uh, the effectiveness of that training by running our own internal phishing phishing campaigns uh, email, staff will receive emails that are um, uh, they've been created by our IT team, but they're designed to test whether the training has been has been effective. And uh, if we find that people are um, nonetheless clicking on links and emails, which uh, uh, um, when they when they shouldn't, then that prompts a need for, for further training. 
No, Chris, thank you for that. And and, and you work, um, you know, with, with, with your own uh, P&I club and also with the international group and so on. And we saw some examples of um, um, hacks and so on. But do we know how many vessels have been, been affected in this way and especially ransomware? <laughs> I don't have any stats stats on that. I mean, the the attacks that have taken taken place, John. The one the, the one distinguishing feature is what what has uh, been affected by those attacks has been primarily shore based um, shore based systems, and so things like um, uh, cargo booking booking systems, um, uh, email email systems. Of course, there's been a knock on effect on the on the ships themselves because uh, it, with with an absence of documentation or clearances. Uh, they haven't been able some haven't been able to to trade but the the primary impact of those attacks that have taken place have been upon the company's shore based operations and of course the cost of um, restoring systems is is very is very costly you know that's that's where you need to that's where cyber risk insurance comes into uh, comes into play that uh, if you need to uh, engage experts to restore all your systems recover your recover your data get things moving again a it's a costly operation and b it takes time uh, and um, and then you've got as the uh, the video emphasized the the reputational impact that that can come from from that uh, which has to be managed so uh, you know the companies if they are subject to these these attacks, um, are quite often involve PR uh, have run their own PR campaigns to make people aware of what's what's going going on. And of course, that all costs money. So that's that's why this uh, additional layer of uh, cyber risk insurance is is important. Yeah, um, but thank you. You know, the, the cost of that, of course, is also going up all the time because because of the risk the risk environment in which we're um, we're, we're living. It's uh, yeah. the risk is not going away. So um, it, one would hope that if a company is able to to demonstrate through a, a level of not only through uh, its precautions, its um, systems, and its um, cybersecurity arrangements it has in place. That it's got that issue under uh, control, but also staff are trained. Not only trained, they are regularly trained. Uh, that has an important bearing on an underwriter's assessment of risk. No, thank you very much for that. And it's very interesting. It was a question put by Stephen um, uh, from Saudi Arabia, who was asking whether it was support systems or the critical safety navigation system. So just turning to those uh, for a moment, a, a question from uh, Liston. Um, in, in India, um, for, for you, I think, Colin, is the the required frequency of, of cyber security checks on 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 on, on ECDIS and so on. What, what uh, is there any guidance yeah, well, I, you can ask around that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah I mean, to follow on from Chris, I think you can't be um, too frequent with your updating and and training, but particularly with ECDIS, I think it's a it's a case of understanding your the firewall that. Is, is supposed to be in place and how that's um, protecting <clears throat> pardon me, that system. Also that you do frequent updates on the system and uh, and also the, the, the dreaded uh, USB stick, you know, that people don't plug that into your ECDIS system. They don't plug it into any system really unless it's their own personal computer. So yeah, uh, thank, yeah thank I, think, I think they're all critical. Well, I'm going to turn to those uh, more detailed bits and, and, and ask Cronus to respond. And, and again, it's related to to Ectis. Um, and, and the question um, is probably from the same Stephen, actually. But ENC updates are essential to safe navigation. Data downloads via internet, especially FTP gateways, and data transfer by USB seem to be very unsafe. What what can the industry do to to find a better way to do this? Well, uh, first of all, we need to understand that uh, this is not something that is direct, directly related to internet connectivity. It is an issue and cybersecurity is an issue that has come up to the industry as we move forward in the digitalization um, journey of the industry. I, I've been a Navy officer since 1999 and back then when I was on board ships, everything was more or less analog. Now everything is digital. So we need to understand how to operate everything. We need to understand what are the do's and don'ts, what we can connect and what we cannot connect. But when we try to understand and look at the remoteness of the vessel and its 
need to connect to the office. We need to have secure protocols in place because there is only one connection from the SIP to the office, and we need to make sure that that connection is secure. Of course, when we come to the uh, SIP specifically, we need to have networks segmented. We need to have business networks. We need to have vendor networks, and we need to have crew entertainment networks. But still, the infrastructure is one and the same. So we need to make sure that the the SATCOM provider that we have can reassure us that everything is in place from a technology perspective, and it's up to us to develop the procedures and the policies and also train our staff to make sure that we are cyber resilient. So not every ship has got, uh, Cronus, for you again, not 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 every ship has got um, so so much internet connection. Are, are, are these at less risk then if, if they've got less, less access to the internet? That, that's a good question and a question that we get a lot. And the reality is that they are at the same or, uh, if I could say, even at a higher risk because we are under the um, misconception that because we are not connected, we are not vulnerable. But you have engine, in the engine room, you have engine control consoles which have USB sticks open. And we have seen uh, in our engagement as Hudson, we have even found Skype being installed into an engine control console. So as soon as you have these things, as soon as you have third party applications installed or you need to have updates to the system, every time that you connect a USB stick which is not provided by the vendor, you can create and you can introduce risks to the shipping environment, to the environment of the vessel. Okay, um, and my thanks to Mohammed in Indonesia for, for that question. Uh, we've had a couple of similar questions, uh, Chris, which, which I'd, I'd, I'd like to put to you. Um, and, and, and maybe this is something you do work through with, with, with your clients, but what, what are the steps that you expect the ships to take um, if they come under, under a cyber attack? <laughs> Um, well, first, first of all, is to uh, notify notify all relevant relevant authorities, depending on where the where the where the ship is, because uh, you know, there is a uh, a grave concern that, I mean, particularly uh, there's particularly a concern in the United United States that they don't want their uh, infra port infrastructure threatened by a, a vessel that um, uh, has a cyber cyber event. So, if there's anything going going on, uh, the, the first First thing is notify, notify the authorities, notify the uh, the owners, get in touch with the the the, D, the DPA, um, and then it is first of all making sure that the ship is the ship is safe, uh, the ship's in a, in a in a safe safe situation, and then going through things step by step, see what has what has been affected, what um, what critical control systems might have might have been might have been affected. And um, taking things from there, but uh, you know that is the point at which you then need to get in, uh, get IT specialists involved to to look at look at the systems, understand what the issues are, understand the extent of the problem, and then put that right. Which is um, where, um, and as as I said during my um, uh, my, my presentation. Our club cover is only uh, concerned with the consequences of vessel vessel operation. So if there's a if there's a cyber event on the vessel and control control is lost, and there is a collision or there's a grounding and there is there is there is pollution, the consequences of that are are, are covered. What we don't what doesn't fall within the scope of normal PNI cover is the cost of putting right the ships the ship systems, and so that that is an area where. Uh, and an owner needs to have separate cyber risk risk insurance in order to um, uh, to get the expertise that's needed to restore data, um, uh, collect material from backups, and um, get the ship up and running running again. And uh, I, I don't think there's a great many owners that have have that cover at, uh, at present. So it's an area area of risk. That uh, you know, if something goes wrong, then the the consequences and the cost of sorting it out could be significant. Thank you. You know, I cover yep. is there. For the, you know, liabilities that might uh, might arise. Yeah, that that was a question which was clearly of interest. It was posed by by two. Uh, Two of our panel, uh, two of our delegates, uh, Sinclesia and um, Samir. So thank you for those questions. Um, uh, another one that came in from um, Brazil, actually, uh, 
Segberto. Um, and, and Cronus, I'm going to come back to you. Um, pilots with their portable pilot units who want to plug into um, the ship systems. What, what's, what's the threat? What do, we, what do you reckon? <laughs> Uh, well, it depends uh, what exactly is the operation that they want uh, to do on board the vessel. But the best practice that uh, we have introduced and we are discussing a lot with uh, the companies that we work with is to have on board the vessel a standalone computer and a standalone printer. And that applies not only to what pilots want to do, but also uh, to inspectors that come on board or even uh, suppliers that want to print out the invoices or the bill of ladings or any other document. Uh, they used to do that in the past by bringing their USB stick connecting to any laptop that was connected to a printer. But the best practice now in order to minimize that risk is to have a standalone PC, a standalone computer, and a standalone printer where you can connect, do your job, and if there's a problem with that computer, that can easily be addressed. No, thank you for that. That is a question. You've answered a question that came up from a number of delegates there about how do you deal with visiting people uh, on board and so on. So um, th th thank you for that. And thanks to uh, everybody for um, for responding to those questions. Um, Colin, just a closing question. I'll, if, if, uh, and this is from Alexandra in, in Ukraine. I want to improve my knowledge on modern cyber security and how to protect the private and business data from cyber crime attacks. What, what can people do about that? <laughs> Well, you're in the, in the right place, I suppose, because we've just developed a, a course uh, of awareness and, and discussion around the the, re the remedies for these problems. So I think the NIF's course now will be an ideal place to go to, uh, to start that thank journey. You. Thank you for that. And can I just say thank you to all of you for, for the preparations you put into uh, delivering the presentations, for responding so agilely to... Um, to, to the uh, the questions that were put from the audience. Um, and David, listen, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, can I please hand back to you for some closing remarks? <clears throat> thank, thanks, John, and, and thank everybody. Um, and, and thanks to everybody who's attended and uh, sent in questions. My gosh, I am absolutely shocked how many people have written in saying that um, inspectors and third parties hired by the ship owners themselves come on board with USBs wanting to stick it into the systems. Um, it's just incredible how many how, how many people have written in about that. Um, so uh, scary stuff there. Um, like uh, Colin said, uh, the course is available. Uh, if you go to our home site, uh, www.notins.org, um, you can find it under the um, NI Academy section, or just uh, drop us a line on the uh, email that you'll get with the uh, thank you for attending message and we'll sort you out with that. So just in closing, just remind everybody that we are a membership organization, so please do become members of the Nautical Institute. We have uh, branches all over the world, uh, so now hopefully that things are opening up a little bit. Uh, uh, not only do they do um, virtual events, but uh, hopefully they might start doing physical events as well, and that's a great way to do professional networking. So yes, in closing, please become a member. Uh, be safe, be cyber safe. And uh, again, thank you to the speakers and thank you for everybody in the audience. Okay, thank you everybody. Bye.